and then customers and readers. Uh, Givenchy had Audrey Hepburn and Tom Ford had Julianne Moore and and then Lafleur has ambassadors made the power. So uh, how does it feel to be a fashion muse? Uh, this is a new, a new experience. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it to me. Uh, yes, we are so excited to have uh, Ambassador Power here. Um, ambassador Power, as many of you know, served as the ambassador to the United Nations under the Obama administration. And currently you're a joint professor both at the Harvard Kennedy School and law school. Correct. Is that right? Okay. All right. So we have some really hard hitting questions for you today. I'm ready. All right. Iran, okay. <laughs> North Korea. Yeah. Bring it on. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to start with uh, talking about your experience while uh, you were at the Obama administration. I understand that uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon once uh, referred to as Samantha Jones, and I quote, uh, the sex addicted businesswoman played by Kim Cattrall on HBO's Sex in the City. So uh, that wasn't his yeah, way of describing her. right exactly that was uh, I quote from from Ambassador Power's book. Uh, so Netflix has decided to turn your life story into a show. Who should play you? Ooh, well, it depends on what age. <laughs> Let's say uh, your your Obama years. My Obama years. Yeah, Connie Britton maybe. Oh, love her. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, Julianne choice. Moore. Also excellent choice, Friday Night Lights. Yeah, not that I've thought about this before. <laughs> you should start yeah, thinking I, about I, it. I don't think so, but uh, but no, there. I, I immediately think of the redheads. The yeah, red redheads yeah, in the world. great. Yes, you're right. Uh, those are two fabulous ones. Um, so continuing on the theme of TV, I feel like most people, myself included, really don't have a clue about what actually happens in the White House or in the State Department or in the United Nations. So, um, have you watched any of the following shows? Homeland, Madame Secretary, Vice, or House of Cards? I watched Homeland. I'm up, I'm up to date, I think, on Homeland. Excellent. And House of Cards, I stopped when he killed Zoe. <laughs> that yes, was, that was, was end far. of season, season one. Yeah, I think so. Or, yeah, yeah. two, I think. But, you, um, um, and you've never seen Vice? I have not seen Vice. Okay, well, okay, between Homeland and House of Cards, which is the closest portrayal of your job as UN ambassador? Um, well, Robin Wright, uh, to her great credit, came to interview me before oh, she uh, played UN ambassador, right. before I guess she eventually, I was I was no longer watching the show, but before she became president. So uh, I, my sense is she got the UN ambassador thing kind of right but, she, got, she got the steely look for sure yeah. she and the wardrobe mm. she had amazing uh, clothing yeah. she had a lot more authority uh than i did as the spouse <laughs> of the president if uh -huh. i were michelle obama right. if i had been michelle right. obama i would have that kind of authority but um homeland i thought i think homeland is good at uh conveying the threat and uh -huh. the kind of the intensity of mm -hmm. some of those moments. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but no one show I think really nails it. Okay, fair enough. So why enough. people should serve and have the experience That's themselves right. in the situation room. My dad, total sign notes, did serve in the State Department for thirty seven years. He says watching Homeland gives him PTSD. Uh, uh huh. So he had to stop watching it at some point, which is the way I actually feel about um, Silicon Valley. Oh. Uh, which I don't know I if you've ever that. No, yeah, now everyone thinks it's a total uh, exaggeration, and it's it's borderline. You know, you have to. Like, there, there's can some I, elements of truth. Can there. I tell you though? I, while people who aren't in government and don't have to read uh, intelligence of various terrorist threats to our embassies around the world yeah. uh, every day. People who don't have that experience of doing it in real life, I think Homeland and these other shows yes. are very, for me, and that and The Americans, which I think yeah, also. Yeah, also a great show. Uh, but both of them almost hit too close to home. Uh -huh. And the shows that, that I have binged on in more recent years are not those. Oh, are not those. Younger. I, mean, I love Younger, but so I'm I think younger. obsessed with Younger. Actually, Callie, our art director, our creative director, is the one who said, you, you're going to love this show. It's very, um, it, not a lot of people know about it. I know. know. Yes. And we, uh, Cass was the one who discovered it, but we, uh, now that I, Professors whenever I meet people. Cass Sunstein discovered yeah, younger. He's a wow. reader okay. of Entertainment Weekly and <laughs> uh, much more culturally conversant than I am. But uh, now when I do meet people, it's like a secret thing. You just say Team Charles, Team Josh. Oh, which, boy. And which are you? Um, I'm, I was Team Charles until the last season. Oh, I'm way gosh. A bit. I'm way Team Josh. Oh, you are? I think that's the true love. <laughs> that's the true love. Um, well, continuing on that theme of true love, 
you married your husband, Professor Cass Sunstein, um, six months into meeting him. And then you also decided to go work for uh, President, then Senator Obama, basically after you had dinner with him. So you spent like two or three hours with him and then you decided to go work for him. So um, is it, I think it's fair to say a lot of your most important decisions have been made in a relatively short amount of time. I have never thought of that parallel before. Ah, okay. Uh, and it, <laughs> it is absolutely true uh, that I, I follow my gut, yeah. you know, and in both of those instances, almost as soon as I sat down with Obama, having, of course, I'd seen his famous speech, sure. and I, he was the, w one of the rare bright spots for Democrats that year. This was early 2005, and he had just gone into the Senate. Mm -hmm. As soon as I sat down with him, I was like, I'd like to work with this guy. And then the entire dinner, which ended up stretching around four hours, was a classic female mm -hmm you know, contest within my own mind. Yeah. Like, ask him. Don't ask him. That would be so <laughs> presumptuous. That would be so lame. You'll come off as such an ass. Wow. Ask him. This At is this your point, chance. At this point, you the Pulitzer Prize. You're still thinking. Stop. Okay. It okay. never yeah. changes. Uh, he'll think you've come on too strong. Ask him. Anyway, so the whole thing. So finally, he's about to get in his car. Literally, the engine is idling. His yeah. driver's come to pick him up. It's yeah. midnight. We're on the sidewalk. I've had four hours mm -hmm. to say... You know, w would you be able to use my services in uh -huh. some way? And then finally, he's just about to leave. How would you feel if I worked? <laughs> in would you mind if I gave him work for you? And so the rest is history. And with Cass, I I met, and it's actually a uh, consolation for many people. Cass uh, was a fancy law professor whose work I admired from afar, but whom I did not know. Yes. And he accidentally sent an email to the entire Obama campaign. He meant to send it to one person, mm -hmm. but he sent it, to, he autofilled. His uh -huh. computer autofilled. Right. And I was one of the recipients where he savaged the Obama campaign. This was in the early uh -huh. weeks and months when we didn't know what we were doing. It was a bit of chaos. It was something about a meeting being horribly boring. It was about a speech on the rule of law ah, that okay. Obama needed to give yes. and the group had produced nothing. <laughs> so it was a tiny little subset of the yes. larger drama that was uh -huh. going on. But I received this and I was so, I just, whenever you get one of those that you're not supposed to get. Totally. We've all been there. We've all sent we've, one. We've all sent one. <laughs> and so that gives us more empathy totally. for those who make the we've same We've all mistake. sent one and we've all received one, at and least. I had not, like, maybe a year before, accidentally sent an email savaging a blind date. Yeah. Not to the person with whom I went on the blind, the very bad blind date, I tried to send it to the person who set me up to yeah. say, what were you thinking? Like, how could you possibly have thought? What on earth, yeah. But I went and I itemized all that was wrong with his friend, and I accidentally sent it to a listserv of thousands of genocide survivors, <laughs> scholars, and activists. And so that had happened to me. So when I got cast, this famous Professor Cass Sunstein, I got his, I just thought, oh, he feels so small right now. And... So I reached out to him and now we're married a... with two kids. But yeah, it was, it was it was almost as soon as I met him, wow. it was clear that finally. Wow. So when are you indecisive? Um, that's a great question. Um, wardrobe, definitely. Okay. Like, standing. Uh, you know, so I have I think to choose a lot the of night our before. Customers can relate to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what am I in? I'm not that, I suppose not that indecisive about things I care about. Yeah. Like I tend to have an instinct one way or the other. But government was hard yes. because, you know, I I'm, would have a reputation being, you know, kind of sure of myself and human rights. and But in government, you're constantly confronted with incommensurables, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. So, for example, President Modi takes power in India mm -hmm. and it's clear he's not exactly pluralistic in mm -hmm. his mindset. He's very nationalistic. Right. And so the temptation is, let's be frontal and let's be very uh, firm with him in the, in the early months, but we have to get a climate deal right. and the Paris Agreement. And so even, you know, it's not all, it, uh, people portray government as being national security versus human rights. You know, if you, you suck up to governments because you want to cooperate on terrorism, but often it's two things that progressives really care about sure. equally, yeah. you know, the rights of uh, minorities and the need to protect our planet. And so, you know, I don't want to say I was indecisive, but definitely there's a lot of weighing and trying to seek out alternative viewpoints and sure. land in a sensible place. Well, that, I guess, leads me to my next question. You have a phrase that you use in your book, your GSD people, your get shit done people. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about who these people are. 
There, I came across so many of them, and mm-hmm. that was so heartening. You know, we're, we're living and talking now at a time where civil servants and diplomats and others are being attacked in a lot of quarters as being Obama holdovers mm-hmm. or their deep state. Or And what was amazing was just the, the, the capabilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, because you, your dad was in the State Department, you said. But, um, I mean, just the, the language skills, the technical experts on how North Korea's like one dimension of North Korea's nuclear program works. Yeah. Um, you know, or iron ore as something they trade in order to get revenue in order to build this one component. I mean, and, and so part of what is beautiful about when you as an outsider come into a system like that is that you've got the big vision you think, or the big dreams about how you're going to change the world. And they've got the know-how, yeah. and and it's that marriage that's that's amazing. But the people I like were ones who were kind of in. We used to, in government, you talk a lot about inputs, uh-huh. and the people I most gravitated toward were those who were impatient with celebrating inputs, yeah, and entirely focused on outcomes, outcomes yeah, and not even outputs, right? Because you could, for example, I could in the UN go to the Security Council and I could demarch the Russian ambassador and tell him what was what. That's an input. We could even get out of the Security Council a resolution mm-hmm. that showed the unity of the world, but if it isn't actually helping anybody right. in the country that's, you know, that we're discussing or where a crisis is, has broken out, like, okay, we can feel good, we have a great statement out of the Security Council, who cares? And so it was nice over time to find a critical mass of people who had that same kind of impatience. Yeah. Your GSD people. The GSD people, yeah. Um, well, someone in my office had mugs made. Uh, the GSD people? Yeah, just said GSD. Wow. And, like secret and only some people could get those mugs? That would have been <laughs> me. The secret club. <laughs> we want people, it would be part of like being married to Cass, who's done so much on behavioral science. Uh, so much about life is about priming sure. and, and identity. And so if people view themselves as GSD oh people, my they gosh. are more prone. So you just leave it on every so new employee's every, every, desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, okay. That, that impulse, that, I love that, that compass. That. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fashion. I swear this is the only fashion question left. Um, you described yourself as a tomboy, and there's a, a part where you're talking about your wedding, and you said you organized a soccer game, I think maybe several hours before your wedding, which I, as a, you know, bride is an interesting choice, and not only did you organize it, you then played in it, and then you showed up in your hotel suite covered in mud much to the horror of your makeup stylist and your your hair stylist so i'm assuming your philosophy towards fashion is pretty simple <laughs> it is simple yes it is simple i will say that my wedding was in ireland and uh so certainly hair stylists and makeup artists were accustomed to people arriving wet <laughs> <laughs> To their, to their... Right. Uh, it was nothing they hadn't seen before. Yeah, the mu- but but, but the to mud. be coming, you know, and I think one of my knees was bleeding. <laughs> I think it was not a pretty sight. But I thought, what a way to kind of let out the, the stress totally. and, and bring everybody together. It was yeah, actually attention. wonderful. It was on this little green in Waterville, County Kerry, and it was storming and, you know, practically a hailstorm. Uh, it, was, it was crazy. But, um, yeah, I think... Uh, simple. I, I was drawn to Robin Wright's wardrobe on, sure. on House of Cards. Yeah. And, you know, I was one of those people who would watch an episode and then Google. Yeah. Know, what is she out. wearing? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, and then try to get something people. on a discount somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, very simple, um, you know, solid colors, uh, you know, kind of like what I'm wearing now. But um, I suffice to say, I didn't have a ton of time to think about it, sure. but I will... When I, got, I should have thought about it more because especially when I became public facing, it's one thing to be a staff, sure, or, right? And there you're in functional mode. And I had two, my two children, I had both of them while I was working as the President's Human Rights Advisor at the White House. Uh-huh. And so there my goal was, especially while pregnant, you know, as I was racing to the situation room because of some crisis, not to fall down the stairs, <laughs> wear flats, right. very functional clothing, um, mainly suits, staples, you know, what you'd expect. Then suddenly I become UN ambassador. Yeah. I'm a member of the president's cabinet. I'm attending the State of the Union. I'm attending state dinners. And to be oh, clear, oh, I have to no... tell you something oh, funny yes, please. that I just remembered. So my first state <laughs> dinner, oh, I have to remember what it was. So my first state dinner, uh. I splurged and I went out and I got the most beautiful in my mind anyway green dress yes. like 
you know, Irish green. I could have been in an Aer Lingus ad. It was such a beautiful dress. There's no more beautiful dress that I've ever seen. It's still my favorite dress yeah. that I've ever worn. And I went, and what happens at the state dinners is that you wait with your partner, whoever you're attending with, and then they announce your name over the microphone. Uh-huh. So it's like, ladies and gentlemen, or you know, members of the press corps, or ladies and gentlemen, Barack and Mich- President Barack Obama and the First Lady Michelle Obama, and then they walk out and they yeah. get out there and everybody. So I had never done it before, and I didn't realize they did it for the, you know, the other people. Yeah, for the, the others, the yes. Go- <laughs> and the government, and there's celebrities, and Steven Spielberg's there, and this and that. And so they announce me and Cass, and then we go through the photo line, and and people are shouting out questions. Yes. And the questions could be, you know, what's your response to the latest chemical weapons attack in Syria? Yes. Or for the very first time in my life, I got that that's a beautiful dress. What are you wearing? What, who, who, who are, are you wearing? wearing? Who are you wearing? <laughs> so there's a, and there's, I think this video exists of this. Oh this is a picture God. of me going like this to Cass. That's and I said, amazing. Cass, who am I wearing? <laughs> Tell who me. am I wearing? And he's like, bad, badly, badly, mishki, mishki, bad, badly. <laughs> Yeah, and it was wow. a beautiful dress. And but I'm I I, sure. I missed my moment. I missed my moment to say I'm wearing. Yes, he designed it for me. Yeah, no, no, it was a bit of an off the rack job, but it was it was uh, quite the moment of having a photo that's, being like that's amazing. With, with Cass kind of you know, looking yeah. right. Okay, so that was about. Uh, but but I I mean when you're public facing, I think it is. It, you know, it, it's it's part of representing the United States. So as the more time I was in my yes. job, the more I realized like I'm America here. I want to take this seriously. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, now you'll have MMA tour. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the one book you tell every person to read aside from, of course, your fabulous four books. Um, it varies. It depends who I'm talking to. Okay. Um, I would start, since communication is important for everyone, with George Orwell's Politics of the English Language, Mm. Uh, especially for people who are just seeking to express themselves. It's it's got basic rules in it, nothing fancy. In fact, the whole point is don't be fancy. Never use a big word when a small word will do. Uh, Think about your metaphors, you know, actually think about them. Mm -hmm. Do they work? Because... The reason pe- people mix metaphors is they're no longer thinking about what they're saying, so they're <laughs> they're merging things like that. Uh-huh. So I think baseline, um, if we are going to learn to hear each other again, just communicating in a spare and um, other regarding way, and sure. that's what that book is. And then for young women, I always want people to read um, a room of her own, and, oh, yes, and of uh, so that's a staple as well, sure. just to. Um, have somebody imagining um, what it would have been like to live in Shakespeare's time and to be the great writer and to be silenced in all the ways that women were silenced mm-hmm. and continue to be silenced in mm-hmm. so many parts of the world uh, and in so many communities in our own country. So so I think that brings people back. You then have a sense of your own privilege yes. if, as a woman yeah. and uh, with the platforms that some of us are lucky enough to have and you want to use that yeah. on behalf of those who don't. Sure. So it's a good motivator. Um, it's a nice segue into our next question. So a lot of what our readers, customers are interested in talking a lot about now is mental health in the workplace. And I was actually really, one of my favorite chapters in your book is actually Monster, but not probably for the reasons, you know, that most people think like, oh, this is juicy, but I thought you were so forthcoming with, um, what a difficult time this was for you. And you talk about, I think, lungers, is that how you pronounce lungers, it correctly? Yeah. yeah um, which is it kind of an anxiety attack, would you say? It, um, for, for me, it's just a constriction in breathing. But the reason yeah. I don't associate with panic attack, or uh, I, I don't know if yes. it is that, it, yeah. uh, because it's just, but is it's not sudden it's a kind of chronic like for days you can't breathe right right it lasts so long it's not time. like hyperventilating or anything like sure. that it's just you just you I, like you yawn you sigh you try to get air in yeah and one of the things that is so striking about it or was striking especially when i was trying to understand it better this kind of thing that with ailment i suppose that i had was it would always come when i had no stress yeah. no conventional stress yeah, it yeah. was when i had wide open spaces mm. where i you know, whenever you're busy and you're in the the zone and right. you're juggling, I, I would that was I would thrive in those yeah. times. And then in those times, I'd be like, oh, I can't wait to have time to read. You know, I've got 
list of books. I can't wait. I have time to go to the gym. Yeah. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to send all those thank you notes I've been meaning. And then those times would come and I'd be like, I can't break it. <laughs> what am yeah. I going to do? So I wrote about it. I, look, uh, I think when you're lucky enough to reach a certain, you know, stage in your career, mm -hmm. you know, editing a magazine or, uh, you know, running a company or being in, in a senior government position, whatever, there is a way in which people can look at you and think that you're no longer relatable, that sure. somehow it's always been inexorable that you were going to end up where you ended up. Yes. And, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> not so much. And, and so to open up, there's a saying in the book that I come back to again and again, I come back to it in my life, which is never compare your insides to somebody else's outsides. Yeah. So at the White House, I'm seeing all these people strutting around and looking like they know exactly what they're doing and where they're going. And only when I got to know them, especially the women among them, yes. did they confess, no, like I had to Google Oval Office map <laughs> in order to figure out where the hell Obama was my first briefing. You know, I thought I was the only one who had to Google that map. And, and, um, and so in describing some of the mental health issues I've had or addiction in my family and, yes. and sort of the, what I carry out of that experience... It's just, it's in part just to remind, we're all, no matter where you get, you know, your your insides are still your enabler if you can master them or they can hold you back. Sure. And, and I've certainly had it both ways. Yeah. And Monster, where I lost my temper in the Obama campaign against Hillary Clinton in the primary in, in 2008, and I had to resign the campaign. And now it seems like a blip. Certainly very few people other than I remember it, at least as... Viscerally, right? As I, as right. As you into the into floor. <laughs> but uh, but what was important I thought about telling the story is, um, you know, people are when you become a villain, and I was as small as it seems now, I led the news, you know, in every on every continent, yeah, because the campaign was was itself leading the news, and this was seen to be me calling a bad name and then having to resign was seen to be this kind of epitome of the mudslinging i mean now compared to what i mean is yes. done on a daily basis it seems so um so mild so but right yes yeah. but i mean googling yourself and then seeing ma mandarin characters and then samantha power <laughs> monster you know or, or right. like seeing your name in in a obscure like pakistani urdu newspaper you know it just was everywhere and and the, the narcissism that goes with becoming, you would think narcissism comes with success. Sure. But there's no narcissism like that of villainy. Right. Where you actually think that everybody's thinking about you at yeah. all times. Yeah. At a certain point, you, you know, especially when you're off the campaign, totally. nobody's thinking right, about you. Right. And so just to open up that, because hopefully people won't have the experience of becoming a global scandal uh, in a matter of minutes. But... Uh, it's not a lot of fun, like hitting refresh, yeah. and then and then, but then to be self critical and see how it how it warps you, um, yeah, and makes you a little you know trepidatious sure. going forward. I mean, what's the piece of advice you give to other colleagues who are, I think, holding down jobs that are essential? You know, either it pays the mortgage or it's a career right. that they really love, but they have real mental health issues. You know, what's the advice you give to them today? Well, I. I mean, I'd say two things. The first is just the reason I opened all that up and opened up other dimensions of the the behind the scenes as well, like mm -hmm. miscarriages and fertility treatments sure. in the middle of the Arab Spring and, and all of that is the general message, I suppose, is, is you're not alone. Like mm -hmm. You'd be amazed how many people are carrying... Um, you know, some kind of, I call my head the bat cave, you yeah. know, the bats like flying around and, mm -hmm. and diverting you or injecting doubt into, into what you're trying to do. So bats or demons in writing this book, I've now had the experience of traveling around or, or receiving, you know, hundreds of notes from people who've read it. And you know, I expected people to say, Oh, on Syria, I think you should have done this or, on, uh -huh. you know, well, why didn't you do this on, on political prisoners and on human rights and, I'd say 90% of the notes are on anxiety, sure. addiction, Wow, you know, just, and people that I worked with really closely who I thought were marching around with none of these issues. Yeah. And so I guess message one would be, you're not alone. You're not alone. And yeah. so, and so the more we destigmatize some of these questions and open up, I think the more joined people who feel like they're laboring in isolation kind of feel. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I guess the second piece of advice, which is broader, is um, Cheryl Sandberg, of course, has given us the, the mantra of leaning in. Yeah. And I have adapted that when I look back and at the lessons I've learned over the different careers that I've had. And for me, especially once I had kids, but, but even before then, my mantra is lean on. Love that. And, um, and there's vulnerability in both of these messages, right, in, in being prepared to share and open yourself up. Um, so that others also feel less alone, but then in finding that solidarity. And then there's vulnerability in saying, I need help. Yeah. I mean, when I was ambassador with two small kids and a husband who was commuting, um, and not Mr. Mom in the best of circumstances, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. I note, uh, and I had to call my mother who's a doctor, which is 75, and a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital, and be like, Mom, they just called an emergency meeting of the Security Council. Come, come, can you get coverage? Because I can't. You know, so here I'm saying to, and to my stepfather who'd, who was retired had raced down and my my girlfriends who, who lived, many of them lived in New York City and they yeah. had to show up, you know, and just, and just being able to say, I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable here. I'm, I'm lost without you, yeah. friends and family. And, yes. and, and of course, to, to, to remember, um, you could get very oppressed when your work is sure. bearing down on you yeah. or you feel... Like you're juggling badly and what leaning on people do and being self-conscious that that's what you're doing is it, there's always a kind of a, 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 a ray of gratitude that mm-hmm. even in the darkness you're like, okay, this sucks. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing nothing right. But man, am I lucky. Yeah. You know, and so if you, if, you, if you have that appreciation, it's 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 sort of a boost in, in low times. Yeah. So, um... I'm going to just reveal myself and my girl crush moment, which is that when I came, uh, when I started university, I think that was the year that you actually had won the Pulitzer Prize and you were at the Kennedy School. So I audited one of your classes and um, was so inspired. And um, But I thought you were my girl crush. And then I was on the phone with one of my college, uh, my, one of my friends from college this morning, um, and I, I told her that I was going to have a chance to meet you. And she was like, oh my gosh, I had the biggest girl crush on her in college. That's um, why you're friends. There aren't a lot of n- <laughs> I promise you. And then, and then, just to prove this theory even more. So, um, Professor Michael Ignatia, he's quoted saying um, that Samantha Power has had more influence on the career paths of young women in public policy schools around the world than almost any other single figure. So how does that make you feel? Um, well, let me say my, my, <laughs> my yes. absolute favorite thing, I hope this isn't humble braggy. It might be a little bit, but, um, but if you say that, that's, 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 that's please, to, to, this, is the, this is the it. opportunity to just brag. No, uh, it's amazing the, cause I just come off a book tour of yeah. a few months, uh, where I was on the road and went to 40 cities, so many universities, um, but also, you know community centers and world affairs councils and churches and and the number of women who come up and say I read your book in my human rights class in college and I was going to do this and then I changed my mind and went overseas and I worked for three years or better yet um where there's always a couple different ways to read the the writings that I've done in the past one is the kind of narrow way that they are about genocide or human rights sure. or something in foreign policy but I I had hoped in writing them and especially the most recent book but that the spirit of them is much more broader uh-huh. in application and that's how they're read uh-huh. by by some at least in the sense of the spirit of the book is kind of just care mm-hmm. and try mm-hmm. right and learn maybe now the new spirit is care try learn maybe and I'm gonna I'm gonna also say um steal <laughs> no, 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 no. So you have to That's share the, the anecdote. Unethical. That's the unethical underbelly. <laughs> I, I, I love that story because, in some ways, it seems so uncharacteristic from everything else we get to learn about you from the book. But will you please share that story with our audience? Okay, I am not actually a thief. No, no, no. Riches <laughs> or things like that. But no, I did. When I was in my early twenties, I was learning about what was happening in Bosnia. Uh-huh. It was getting very violent and terrible. And I had worked on it for a year from afar at a think tank in a, as an intern. And I decided I wanted to go over there and try to become a journalist, yeah. a war correspondent. I thought if we told the stories of the people who were being targeted, that maybe that would change what was happening at the UN, it would change US policy. You know, I had this kind of lofty 
um, ideals and thought that the power of the pen was, was intense. And I um, got U.S. News and World Report and American Magazine to agree to take my phone calls if I went over there. Yeah. And that was unbelievable. And there's a whole story about how that came about. But bottom line is I left the chief of correspondence office and realized that I would have some place to contribute my stories if I found my way over there. Yeah. And so I got into the elevator. Like, <laughs> like one of those in the movie. I'm going to be a war correspondent. Uh-huh. I'm going to be a war correspondent. And then I went upstairs, because the only reason I even was in the guy's office was it was in the same building as the think tank where I was interning. And so it was just serendipity, which has been a huge part of my tale, luck. And I get up to my office, and my, I call my friend, who I'm going to go there with, and I say... Um, I'm going to be a correspondent, a freelancer for U.S. News and World Report. Like, this is it. I, I've got a home. And he said, great. You just need a letter from them uh-huh. saying that you work for them or we're not going to be able to get into Bosnia because there are all these checkpoints. And I was like, wait a minute. What? <laughs> he's what? not going to write me a letter. Like, he's just <laughs> said he'll take my call. But, uh-huh. I mean, he's not going to take ownership over me. I've never done this before. And he said, oh, well, then we can't go. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, I realized, or a few minutes later, I realized that the place I was working, I remember that it was the home to a very dense academic journal mm-hmm. called Foreign Policy, mm-hmm. which exists today yeah. as a non-dense, you know, sort of mainstream publication. But back then it was an academic journal you found mainly in libraries, and they had never had a foreign correspondent. But sitting in my office and having my dream dashed only minutes after it was um, instilled in me or affirmed in me, uh, I thought to myself, well, the UN doesn't know what foreign policy is. <laughs> And so when the cleaning staff uh, went home that night um, and it looked like the corridors were dark, I might have walked into the office of the editor of mm. Foreign Policy Magazine and mm. I might have procured some of his stationery <laughs> and I might have returned <laughs> to my office and uh, made the claim on his unwitting behalf uh, that I was uh, going to be the foreign correspondent for Foreign Policy Magazine. I love and so I had my story. letter... I had my press pass, and I retained uh, a guilty conscience. And you went to Bosnia. And so, I did. And, and then... Uh, and you went to there, Bosnia. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, I weighed whether to... We're living in a very ethically challenged time, as you may have noticed yes. at the moment. So I thought, <laughs> yes. what am I doing, including this story, which sort of, you know, it's like ends justify the means everywhere you look. Yeah. I, you know, even for a human rights lawyer, she's breaking the rules. And then I thought... It at least shows the determination. Uh, it's for not sure. I recommend other people. Read, well, of course. I was going to say then what what would be the piece of advice to other women? Twenty two. Maybe we're we're heading into graduation season. I know you've made a, a commencement speech just before, but what would you say to her today? What what should she be doing if she wanted to pursue a career in in human rights? My main advice, no matter what you want to do, um, if you want to make your difference in whatever field is, um, I suppose a little bit old fashioned, but know something about something. Mm. Uh, I find with young people, it's, it comes up from a beautiful place. There's a great desire to make large differences. And, you know, when you look at climate change or racial injustice or inequality, there are issues that are so big. I think people almost feel guilty, um, for swearing them to go work on something yeah. else. And I feel like when you get older, it's your job to give younger people permission to choose. And mm-hmm. and in my own career, I know that by burrowing into a single issue, even if it seems like it's at the expense of other really important causes, you will end up contributing to that issue much more than you could if you're spread thin. Sure. But also you learn in, in going through something and in focusing yourself and in developing that discipline, you yes. develop then the skills that you can then apply to climate transfer. change later mm. and transfer exactly. So I feel there are a lot of people who are finding a lot of wars at once, um, no pun intended, yeah. uh, today who, who want to make the world better. And it comes again from a generous place, but but really drilling into something and knowing something about something, I think is is the best thing somebody, Love. a young person can take to heart. Uh, pick a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Choose your slice, Choose your, your sliver, your sliver. Yeah, I say, you know, the end, because my book is called The Education of an Idealist. And of course, everyone wants to know, what did you learn? And how have you been educated? <laughs> and I think, it, you know, in a way, it, I sum it up at the end um, by saying something like, um, you know, you may not be able to change the world, mm. 
but you can change many individual worlds. Mm. And that's a lot. I love that. Um, well, the elections are coming up. You think? <laughs> Seems to be the only thing people will talk about this year. Um, who's a candidate that you would be excited to go work for? Um, look, I think all the Democratic candidates, um, well, we know how to scandal this week that, that, that may cast some doubt on this claim. But by and large, yeah. they all tell the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of them are in it for personal or financial or political enrichment, self enrichment. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not sitting around thinking, what should our position on healthcare be, which will benefit me, you know, where I will see the financial returns on that. I mean, nobody even thinks in those terms. Um, I think there's, um, a basic, uh, inclusivity and commitment to, or or sort of recognition of what has made America the light of the world for a long time for all of our flaws, which is our diversity and the range of experiences from different parts of the world with different faiths and so forth that we bring to bear. And so at a baseline level, I think any of these candidates who are bringing that agenda and who believe in the importance of norms, decency, um, to try to bring more people together and, and to not you know, actually use the positions of power to divide people, I think at a baseline level to, to serve any of them, I think I'd be, I'd be honored to do it. Um, and I'm not going to tell you which of them I like the best. No, because no, I become no. a diplomat. Anyway. Yes, exactly. Um, I was going to say my, my, uh, when I ask my father questions, he answers them like that too yeah, sometimes. You know, see, and I'm like, I think I, I just something. got an answer. <laughs> no, but, I mean, there, I will see. I mean, I'm, I, they're, I, I, like many Democratic primary voters, I think we, we just all have one issue on our mind, which is electability sure. and who, who's going to win at the next stage. That's how I filter everything. And yeah. Week to week, certain people seem to have more strength than others. So we don't get to Massachusetts for quite a while. So I don't actually technically yes, have to decide yes, for, a while. for a while. Yes, yes, cast your for a while. But it is striking that, um, you know, what certain candidates bring in youth enthusiasm yeah. So far, they appear not to be able to bring, you know, when it comes to independent sure. voters and so forth, people who are great with independence or stronger with non-college educated white voters, you know, are weaker with um, college campuses yes. and, and young women. And, and so it is a bit of a, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to find somebody who's like a, a bit of everyone. Yeah. And, and that's um, that's not going to get us anywhere. So we're each going to have to choose and then just work like hell over the next months. Mm-hmm. To make things happen right well then maybe you could answer this one more with a name Uh-oh. but not a, uh who's a candidate that you wish had gone further oh that's interesting um you know i'm a big fan of deval patrick yeah that's yeah. our massachusetts governor sure. and i you know it, it he just started late it was mm-hmm. it was it yes. was i don't think america's really gotten a glimpse of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, maybe they've just gotten a glimpse and not get, gotten <laughs> right. a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse. Right. He just started so late, but but he really has. Um, I mean, he is Obama's uh, sort of rousing gift um, of speech and an ability to inspire people uh, in a very unusual way. And he's got um, you know the experience of having been a governor of a, of a, a large and important state where. He's gotten to experiment in a lot of policy areas. And, you know, I like governors and mayors and people who've, yeah. who've done the doing. Um, uh, and, you know, le- legislators have a harder time because they're sort of advocating for things. And sure. need to, to, they have different gifts of bringing large coalitions together. But I think, I think Duvall, we haven't heard the last of him, that's for Excellent. sure. Excellent. You and Pete Buttigieg must have overlapped at the Kennedy School. Right? I did not. I did not. No. Know Pete, no. Okay. In fact, I will tell you that uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I think it was right after the Soleimani strike when I was, you know, it used to be that I'd be in the yep. Situation Room actually doing something. <laughs> now I'm up tweeting <laughs> up a vengeance. Uh-huh. But I, I uh, you know, occasionally I look at my notifications right. and, and because I was tweeting in a particularly pointed way, I was kind of curious, like, and I was like, oh, Pete is now following me. Yes. Oh, interesting. What does that say about his Iran policy? Yeah. I tried to like divine sure. uh, backwards. But um, no, that's the extent of my connection with Pete. Yes. Uh, we follow each other on Twitter. Okay. All right. Excellent. I'm pretty sure you would have crossed paths at some point because I think did he you, was IOP you know president. Him? What? Really? You know what, what? what is actually so funny is that girlfriend that I was telling you about who I was talking to this morning, um, 
she said to me maybe five or six years ago, she was like, did you ever hear Pete Buttigieg speak um, on campus? And I was like, no, I, I don't even know who he is. Um, she actually considered going to work for him on his campaign because she, she knew him quite well. And she was like, when I heard him speak his senior year, I thought to myself, this guy's going to be president. Oh, wow. And I just thought that was the, the craziest thing. And here he is. So, well, it is go. wonderful. I mean, he's really in the, in the pack. So it's yeah, great to see him. I know. That's right. Um, all right. I think we're getting to our, sorry, second to last question. Um, okay. If you have $1 million just appeared, uh, but you have to all use it for a good cause, you have to donate it. Where would you spend it? No question in my mind. Um, uh, there's an organization called the International Refugee Assistance uh-huh. Project Program. I think they've changed the name yes. of the program. And um, I've never known an organization like them. They both represent clients, for, like, for example, who've been separated because of Trump's travel ban, sure. where one spouse may have gotten in, and then the travel ban comes down, and somebody else is separated from person they love and so they represent to try to bring about family unification Mm -hmm. even in this very inhospitable environment but then they also um sue the government to try to change policy wow and i've just never it's a very small organization was started by a bunch of law students sure they also have chapters uh at law schools all around the country it's almost as competitive to be part of irap's sort of legal training program on law schools as is it as it is to join the law review now. Yeah. Like it, wow. Because it's such an amazing organization. Yeah. And so I watch all these future lawyers getting exposed and, and actually, you know, representing clients or in a, you know, as you can do when you're in law school, not not quite full representation, but you know, taking testimonies of people who have um, uh, come here under the most horrific and terrifying circumstances. Mm-hmm. And, and I watched these students altered by the experience of having those exposures mm-hmm. you know, at that very formative age. And many of these law students will go on to be corporate lawyers or whatever, but they will always you know, be open to doing pro bono yeah. work. And so it, it, it changes the lives of refugees, it changes our laws, and um, I think it's having a huge effect on young people. That's wonderful. Um, we at MM, we work a lot with the International Rescue Committee. Oh, we love yeah. of our so we, Yeah, we yeah. make a lot of donations to them. And I just, um, well, I joined them about, I went and worked in a refugee camp between my junior and senior year for this, like, you know, very small nonprofit that has since gone under. But I remember all of these um, aid workers wearing, you know, IRC t-shirts. And I was like, one day I'm going to go work well, with them. And uh, long story short, I'm now doing something totally different but one of our customers is one of the development officers at the IRC oh, that's great. and uh, she came to one of our sample sales and she said um, you know the way I spend at your company you must think uh, I run a hedge fund or something but actually I'm a development officer at the IRC and you you know you should get more involved and I was like are you kidding the IRC like I would love to get involved so you know even though my career now is in fashion oh, totally it's never different too late. No, no. you know it's just yeah. uh it's I think it's what you said you know having these experiences can actually it, even if you end up in a totally different industry, you're different because you had it. Yeah. No question, you're you you're can, altered. Shape. By it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, okay, uh, what's next for you? Um, dinner. <laughs> you know what? I just wanted to share. Um, so, with our audience, that while we were doing this photo shoot of you looking incredibly glamorous, you were also looking out for your uh, daughter's school bus. Um, and, uh, I just thought that was like that. And, and, uh, that was such a telling mom moment. Of course, you're doing this glamorous fashion photo shoot. And then you're also making sure that you can get your daughter as she's coming out of the school. Let's, 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 uh, extend the story and describe my martyrdom as I was wearing this beautiful (laughs) dress provided to me for the purposes of the shoot. The bus arrives. It's about 10 degrees outside. Yeah. I'm in the dress. No sleeves. No sleeves. Flip flops. Uh-huh. Running across. <laughs> My daughter gets off the bus. She's like, Mommy, why are you wearing a dress? <laughs> yeah, so it's like, not the I most common thing? I don't no. She has seen me in a dress in some time. She didn't ask, Why are you wearing flip flops <laughs> in the dead of winter? Right. And why are your arms showing? Why are you wearing a dress? Um, no, you know, I, right now I'm focused on. 2020 it feels like it's an all hands on deck uh, moment and you know trying to meet people using the book that I've just written and using my teaching um, in a smaller way but to meet people where they are where I think right now so many people feel activated moved by some crisis or some problem or our political paralysis or however you want to look at it 
And yet often that impulse to try to do something gets swallowed up by a sense of being small. Yes. And so, you know, my little place here, I think is, is not to blow past that and, but to talk to people where they are, which is mm-hmm. feeling small, mm-hmm. wanting to do something and then quickly being on the verge of talking themselves out of trying. Right. And that's what happened in 2016. It's why uh, we are where we are because so many people stayed home. So many women mm-hmm. stayed home just thinking that their vote didn't matter or that maybe the election itself didn't matter or getting complacent about the result. Uh, but that can never happen again. The stakes are too high. So right. that's my focus is just you know affirming that one person can make a difference because right. I've seen it in, in every career I've had. So you're you're gonna help get out the vote, among other things, raise money. You know, yeah. uh, steer people to different causes where sure. you can still make a difference, yes. irrespective of what happens in the vote. There there are a lot of different ways one can do it, and and my way will be different than 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 other people's way. But but it's I mean very few people even remember that the election in 2016 was settled by 78,000 votes spread across three states, mm-hmm. which is 39,000 votes that go the other way. And mm-hmm. if you take the 39,000 divided by three, you end up with like 10 or 15,000 votes. And I mean, it's so small. And, you know, 7% of people who had voted in 2012 stayed home in 2016. Mm-hmm. So there's millions of people who just need to be persuaded to believe that they can make a difference. Right. It sounds like um, women especially. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Thank wonderful. You. That Thank was you so wonderful. Much. Thank you so much.